Hello everyone, this is Jason from Primetime Aquatics and in this video, I am super excited to bring you video number three in our series, Breeding Fish for Profit. In today's video, we are going to be looking at a 20 gallon aquarium. I think this is a fantastic size for breeding fish and maximizing your profit. In the previous video, we talked about 10 gallon options. If you haven't seen that, I will put it in the description below, but anything you can breed in a 10 gallon, you can breed in a 20. So if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend check out, check out that video as well. Okay. What can you breed in a 20 gallon that's gonna make you a little bit of money? Well, here are some suggestions, some things that we've done that I think have worked out pretty well. I mentioned this in the 10 gallon video about shell dwellers, maybe that would be pushing the lower limits, but in a 20 gallon, this is definitely a popular and possible thing to do. And so some fish that we've bred in a 20 gallon are Neolamprologus multifasciatus, otherwise known as the Maltese, the Gold Ocelotus, Similis, Brevis, these are all great options. Now, they may not necessarily be great options if you need to ship your fish because most Lake Tanganyikans are highly sensitive to water, changes in water parameters such as ammonia and nitrate and temperature. But if you have other mechanisms, maybe you've got a local fish store nearby, maybe you've got a you don't mind people coming to your house or meeting people to do an exchange, or maybe you've got a fish market like a local swap or an auction that you can do, these are really good options. The setup is relatively simple and we have species profiles on many different types of shell dwellers. We even did a video on how to set up a shell dweller tank. That Those videos will be in the description below if you want more information. The nice thing is with shell dwellers, it's a relatively simple setup with some sand and some shells. The only downside compared to some of the stuff we've talked about so far in the previous video is you're probably not gonna be able to grow plants and grow and breed your shell dwellers in the same tank. Just because of the amount of digging that they do, it'd be really hard for rooting plants to root in the sand if it's always being adjusted. But for our purposes in a 20 gallon tank, we get a decent amount of fry. Now they don't reproduce as fast as some other fish. So in terms of having a steady income, that may be a little bit more difficult to achieve because in a 20 gallon, you don't have a lot of space. You may only be able to move a small amount of fish every month, but the dollar value attached to those fish is typically going to be more than maybe some of the stuff that we suggested in the first video, like Neocaridina shrimp or guppies and fish like that. Another one I really like in a 20 gallon, and that is the Caudopunctatus, Neolamprologus Caudopunctatus. We've done a species profile on them before. We've actually been breeding them in a 20 gallon high. We've got two 20 gallon standard tanks with Caudopunctatus in them. They are really pretty. Now this is a Lake Tanganyika fish, similar to our shell dwellers, although they're not specifically a shell dweller. So this is not a fish that's gonna ship easily, but for all the other mechanisms that we talked about in the first video, this could be a great option, especially if you've got swaps and auctions, especially if you can sell them via some type of classified local fish stores. If you're in the right environment, if you've got the right type of customer base that, or the environment that has naturally neutral or above water where these fish really thrive, this can be a fantastic option because they're not super common. So the Neolampologus caudopunctatus can be a really good option for that smaller tank. One of the other things that you could consider in a 20 long are Julitochromus. There are lots of Julitochromus species. Pick one that you like. It could be Transcriptus. We have Ornatus that are breeding in a 20 long that I really, really enjoy. Again, this is a Lake Tanganyika fish. So just like all the shell dwellers that we've talked about, it might not be great for shipping, but for all the other mechanisms, this, these are really pretty. They tend to do very well for us at swaps and auctions. One of the nice things about a lot of the Julitochromus is they color up at a very, very young age. And so they start to show those, those nice yellow colors for the Ornatus or the really cool patterning for the Transcriptus. So it's definitely something to keep in mind. The next one to consider, and it's really, really simple, and that are, that's mystery snails. We have a 20 gallon long that is a mystery snail breeding tank. We've gotten mystery snails in other tanks and they started breeding at a 20 gallon high, but mystery snails are really easy to breed. I would just go ahead and buy three or four or five of them, throw them in a 20 long. Eventually you're going to start seeing eggs right above the water line. Again, in the video, mystery snail species profile, I go over more detailed information on how to keep them, how to breed them. But mystery snails can be a super easy thing to breed. That is an organism that's gonna be a little bit easier to ship. So if that's something you need to do, that's gonna be a little bit easier. They're usually in decent amount of demand for local fish stores, or if you go on, on Craigslist or you wanna sell them online. 
Now, the dollar value attached to them is going to be pretty low. The nice thing is the workload is not that high. The main issue with breeding mystery snails is once they begin to breed and you have 30 or 40 or 50 of them in a 20 gallon long, they produce a lot of waste. And so you're going to have to keep up with your tank maintenance with these things because the bottom substrate is usually going to be covered in waste. Now, there is an advantage here, and that is at least for us, we haven't had any problems growing plants with our mystery snail tank. I know some people have said that mystery snails eat plants. Now, I wouldn't grow sword plants or any really thinly leaved plant in a mystery snail tank, but for us, Anubias and Crips, uh, Jungle Val seems to grow just fine. If you wanted to grow some floating plants, that might work as well, but that could be a really good combination. If you could find mystery snails that have a more unusual uh, color pattern on their shells, that might be a better thing to do than breeding the standard golds and the standard blues. So with the shell dwellers, that's really good for hard water. Mystery snails are really good for hard water. If you've got softer water, what can you do? Well, I think this is when you start to look at potentially some of the South and Central American cichlids, as well as some of the cichlids from West Africa. So examples, Epistogramma. There are so many different types, and we've had a lot in our fish room over the years. If you've got a little bit softer water with a little bit lower pH, like let's say seven or less, this might be a really good option for you. Now there's some downsides. Again, the shipping side of things might get a little bit more complicated because they're a little bit more sensitive than let's say mystery snails for sure. A Little bit hardier than probably a lot of the shell dwellers. But if you have local fish stores, again, if you have the ability to put them on Craigslist or meet somebody and sell them that way or a local swap or auction, these could be great. The other thing you have to consider though is it's gonna take a little bit of time to grow them out because you really want them to show color. And a lot of times people who buy a pistogramma, they would prefer to have at least a pair. So you're gonna to have to wait for the fish to get to a size that you can tell the difference between males and females. And so that might be a downside. You might have to hang on to them a little bit longer, but they are generally speaking, if you have the right water parameters, the common epistogramma are gonna be relatively easy to breed. Some of the rarer types might be more difficult, might require some more work because some of the epistogramma, you might have to get the pH down to five or even four. I've heard that some epistogramma, they go even less, especially if they're wild caught. But if you have just under neutral with softer water, this is a great option for you. Staying on the softer water theme, a couple other really good options might be rams. You've got Bolivian rams, you've got German blue rams. Again, for the breeding for breeding purposes, you're gonna want water that's on the softer side with a lower pH, but these are great fish for a 20 gallon. And just like the epistos with the rams, you could potentially grow not breed not only the fish, but also grow plants in that tank. They show a lot of color, which is good. And for these fish, it's gonna be a little bit more tricky, especially with some of the German blues in terms of feeding them early on. We this species profiles on the Bolivian rams, which I will put down in the description below. They can be a little bit more finicky, again, when you're thinking about shipping the fish. But for all the other mechanisms we talked about in the first video, whether that is classifieds or local fish stores especially, or swaps and auctions, this can be a really good option. The other option that you have are crebenzas. Now, for the crebenzas, my strong recommendation is if you're going to be breeding them, try to get some of the more colorful varieties, some of the ones that are a little bit less common. The common crebenzas typically doesn't bring in a lot of money. I know in our market, they, are, they go very, very cheap. And so you'd wanna bring in some of the ones that are gonna have a little bit more color, maybe a little bit different fin pattern, but these can be a really good option, really fun in a 20 gallon. All right, everyone. So I wanted to throw out some options for you. If you're looking for some breeding projects and a 20 gallon, you may have noticed as we've gone through this video, I have leaned towards a 20 long over a 20 high. I think if you're going to set up a breeding tank, the 20 long is going to give you way more options. Now, if you want to see a really cool video on the comparison between a 20 high and a 20 long, I'm going to put that in the upper right hand corner. If you want more information on how to breed some of these fish, check out the lower right hand corner in the description below. We'll have a lot more information, some species profiles on the fish that we've mentioned here. I appreciate you watching and we'll see you in the next one.